you will be pleasantly surprised by Inside Out 2. Let me explain why. What is up everyone? Welcome back to my channel. It is Mike here. Before we start today's video, I would love to encourage you to subscribe to my channel if you wanna see more content like this. Okay, let's get into it. Okay, so last night I was lucky enough to attend the Melbourne preview screening of Inside Out 2, the latest offering from Pixar. And if you've watched my channel for a while, you know that I love overanalyzing stuff made for children to find like the hidden meaning or philosophy behind it. So that's what I'm gonna to do today about this movie. And I gotta say, I haven't thought a lot about the original Inside Out, which came out pretty much 10 years ago, back in 2015. I remember seeing it in the cinemas and finding it pretty bland, to be honest. I know it was really popular at the time, but to me, the personification of emotions just felt like a kind of average concept for a Pixar movie. That being said, I guess all Pixar movies are kind of just like, oh, it's toys, but they're alive. Oh, it's cars, but they're alive. Oh, it's a rat and he's alive. It's robots and they're alive. It's elements like fire and water and they're alive. And I've also been kind of cynical about Pixar's more recent releases, which I've talked about on my channel over the years. So I wasn't really expecting a lot from this movie. That being said, I gotta say I was pleasantly surprised and I actually think I enjoyed this more than the original. And Probably I enjoyed it more than any Pixar film of recent memory. And I gotta say, I spent probably the first 20 minutes or so of this movie teetering a little bit and mainly filling my brain with useless assessments about the characters. First of all, Amy Poehler's character Joy is probably one of the most annoying characters in fiction, full stop. Okay, not what I had in mind. I don't know why she annoys me so much. I genuinely can't explain it. I think it's just because a character that embodies and personifies the emotion of Joy is always gonna get on some one's nerves, especially if they're a pessimist like me. Hello, did I wake you? You have to play that. Well, I have to practice, and I don't think of it as playing so much as hugging. And I started getting bogged down in the logic of these characters who are emotions inside a girl's head. Like for example, they're clearly walking, moving, breathing beings. They go to sleep, they wear pajamas. One of them wears a tie, one of them wears a full suit. And I couldn't quite figure out the logic behind that. I realized this is a kid's movie and you're not supposed to think about that stuff. But before any substance of this movie came in, I was kind of just hooked on thinking about it. Also, there are moments in this movie where the characters are like hanging on for dear life. And it made me wonder, can they die? Like can Joy, the character, die? And then does that mean that Riley, the girl, can no longer ever feel joy? There's also the problem of the fact that characters like Joy are shown being sad. So these characters who are emotions are clearly able to feel a full spectrum of emotions. Does that mean they have their own emotions inside them? And does that mean that it just repeats forever and ever 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 and ever? Okay, let me get into why I thought this movie was actually really good. As the main character Riley is now a teenager, she is starting to deal with new emotions who are of course other personified emotions that hijack her brain and kind of get rid of the core kind of group of joy, sadness, anger, fear, and disgust. These ones are envy, boredom, embarrassment, and of course, anxiety. And I gotta be honest, throughout a lot of my life, I've struggled with a lot of social anxiety and just general anxiety and performance anxiety. And I really relate to the struggles that are kind of depicted in this movie. And there's so much depth here that I feel like I wanna go into, but I think I can surmise it by saying that this movie is a really great way of introducing some very tough concepts to children. You can't just bottle us up. Oh, that's a great idea. <laughs> Not only is the concept of anxiety tackled really, really well, but also like things that I really related to in terms of being a teenager and wanting to fit in and wanting people to like me and feelings that I still have to this day. And also this idea that in order to be liked, particularly as a teenager, you sometimes have to betray your own morals or core values or beliefs. Sometimes to fit in with a group that you wanna fit in with, especially when you were a teenager, you had to kind of pretend to be someone you weren't. And all of that is like personified in this movie really, really well. I feel like it captured that awkward teenage feeling so, so well. Not only that, but you also get this exploration of like burying trauma and repressing memories as the emotions basically take the worst parts of Riley's life and dismiss them into a repressed area of her brain. It's weighing on her, so let's lighten the load. A one-way expressway to, we're not gonna 
gonna think about that right now. Woo! Again, I thought this was such an interesting way of exploring how as humans, particularly when we're young, we tend to bury our trauma and not deal with it at the time, mainly because we don't have the scope or literacy to do so. And I thought this physical analogy of literally putting a memory to the back of the brain in a place that you don't access was just such an apt way of explaining this concept to children. And of course, by the end of the movies, it's the repressed memories that come back and are kind of dealt with that ends up sort of resolving a lot of the conflict and allowing Riley to process her emotions. And seriously guys, this is why most of us spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars a week just going into therapy and pouring our hearts out because this is what we all did. This really goes beyond my training as a furniture salesman, sir. Now, if you don't want the sofa, I'll have to ask you to leave. Probably most relatable to me was this idea of Riley's core beliefs about herself, which start off with things like, I'm a good person, I'm honest, I try my best, I do my best, and things like that, that kind of start getting warped in teenage years into stuff like, I'm not good enough, I'm a bad person. And it was such a great way of conveying this voice inside your head that really can take you to really negative and dark places. I feel like combating that inner voice that we develop in our teenage years and childhood is something that I'm still doing day to day in my life and again spend a lot of time in therapy trying to unpack. And so again having it just spelt out for children in this way I feel like is going to be really helpful for them to refer back to in their adult life. That's not a joke, by the way. I actually think this movie could be shown to lots of children to help them learn these concepts. And I'm pretty sure psychologists would also recommend that. I, I, I actually believe that. Hey, just before we move on, if you're enjoying this video, just a reminder to thumbs up, subscribe, and comment your thoughts below. Okay, let's get back into it. And as I said, this concept of the core beliefs really rung through to me because as I said, I deal with this inner voice and inner critic in my head that is so harsh and so mean to myself that I'm actually actively trying to work around that in my day-to-day -day life. And I'm 30 years old. I'm still not there yet. That's why this movie felt so relevant to me as well. I think providing children with tools and literacy to understand their mental health and the way their brains work is such a great idea that this movie did well in a way that I guess the first one also did. I've also got to shout out this really great scene in which the movie showcases like different animation styles and references to pop culture we're all familiar with. First off, we meet this Blue's Clues style character that also reminded me of like Rock from Rocco's Modern Life in design. It was in this 2D cell shaded style animation that of course we all recognize from our childhood, which also integrated these great moments that kind of beg for audience interaction that didn't really work in the cinema, but I'm sure in some cinemas would. In the same scene, we meet a polygonal kind of PlayStation 1 mascot character who reminded me of either Cloud from Final Fantasy 7 or maybe even Link from The Legend of Zelda. Again, the animation style was so great and felt so seamless in the world. And as well as that, just the video game send up was really fun and I wasn't expecting it at all. But probably the peak moment for me is this moment at the end in which Riley has a panic attack. Now it sounds really weird that I called that the peak moment, but I think I mean like the most meaningful moment, not like the best moment and I'm happy this character had a panic attack. That's just wrong. Essentially, the anxiety emotion goes into this overdrive kind of predicting and speculating about all the worst possible outcomes of everything that could possibly happen. And it just goes into this absolute spin as Riley begins to hyperventilate and her heart starts pounding. The way this movie depicted a panic attack as it would happen inside a child's head was just such a fantastic and poignant moment that was very profound and spoke to me a lot. I feel like it was exactly how a panic attack feels, the fuzziness in your brain and the inability to stabilize. And it's only when Joy reaches in to comfort anxiety and asks her to let go that we're able to get back to some form of homeostasis. And by the end of the movie, the emotions kind of re-regulate Riley's core values by saying things like, yes, we sometimes make mistakes, but we always try our best and we do what we can and we're kind, but sometimes we get upset. And all of these things that is kind of how we want our inner voices to speak to us, to be forgiving, to be self-compassionate and all of those kind of positive qualities that we need in our heads. Overall, I didn't go in expecting much from this movie, but I was honestly so pleasantly surprised and it really made me reflect on my own experiences with my mental health and how I can continue to change that inner voice in my head 
even in this stage of adulthood. And I think that's a really important message that Pixar has put out with Inside Out 2. Thank you so much for watching, everyone. I really enjoyed the movie, as you can tell, and I really enjoyed making this video. I hope you enjoyed watching it. If you've seen Inside Out 2, I'd love to know your thoughts down below in the comments section, as well as that, you can hit subscribe. Check out some of my other videos. There's actually a playlist I've made about all my Disney and Pixar kind of analysis, so I'd love for you to check that out. I'll put it on the screen at the end. As well as that, I have a Patreon, patreon.com slash radio mic. You can subscribe. There's a bunch of bonus podcasts up there. Thanks to all my Patreon subscribers so far. And my podcast, 20th Century Boy, could be there, could be there. I never know. And uh, that is available on my channel or wherever you get your podcast. Please listen. Hey, guys, thank you so much. Make sure you stick around for another video. My name is Radio Mike, and this has been the inside of my mind. Catch you later.